We're going to get to cover, Lord willing, an entire chapter this week and an entire chapter next week. That's pretty good, isn't it? We're in first or second Samuel chapter eight. Let me encourage you to do something. Um, go back and start reading the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles. And uh, you may want to skip over those first eight or nine chapters that have all that genealogy in it, okay? Because that, that'll kill you. But uh, when, you're fi- when you finally get to the text where he's starting the narrative again, rather than the genealogy, he picks up on the place where David is about to go into battle with, um, I believe it's Abimelech, and uh, against Israel. Remember that? And um, the, uh, the king's warriors, the king's army, captains didn't want David and his men going, remember? And so they ran them off. Well, what's interesting is that there were a group of individuals from, uh, I believe it was the tribe of Manasseh, that when David said he was going to go to battle, they refused to do that. Okay, now we don't read about that in the book of Samuel, but you do pick that up in the book of Chronicles. So there are adi- there's additional information that you find uh, sometimes in the Chronicles that adds to the story and adds to the narrative. And so uh, that's pretty interesting stuff. So uh, go back and do a little bit of reading and studying there. If you have some time, it's uh, pretty interesting. Um, I didn't do very well on outlining this chapter, okay, uh, because I've got seven points for the chapter in just 18 verses. Um, And each person, if you were outlining the chapter, you would do it differently. But um, let's see if anybody's got an outline. Anybody? All right, Larry, number one. Philistines defeated. Philistines defeated. Number two. Moab defeated. Moab defeated. Number three. Ah, uh, defeat of the enemies, north, south, east, and west. Gratitude of the smaller nation. Okay, gratitude of the smaller nation, that's number four. Number five. David gets a name. David gets a name. Number six. Secures Israel with uh, garrison. Okay, secures Ir- Israel with, with garrison. And then rules with judgment and justice. Ah, uh, David rules with judgment and justice, point number seven. Very good. Um, it's a long outline. Okay, most time you would combine uh, a lot of that. You might combine it in just two, uh, two sections, okay, really and truly. You might just combine it into the sections all, talking about all the victories against his enemies. And then just that last little section about uh, verses 15 through 18, uh, David's officials. I put down these seven. David subdues the Philistines. David smites Moab. David struggles with Hadadezer. Toai salutes David. David secured a name for himself. David subjects Edom to Israel. And then lastly, David's schedule of officials. So uh, those are my seven points for this chapter. Very, very interesting. Um, Let's just go and let's just talk about what's going on and uh, make some points as we go. Uh, After David placed the ark in Jerusalem, who did he smite and subdue? The Philistines. True or false? Saul had fought a lot against the Philistines. True, folks, the Philistines were just a horrible group of people. Um, Were they attached to the land of Canaan, the Philistines? Do you know? Were they attached to the land of Canaan? I'm talking about their, their land and Israel's land. Or were they foreigners from far away and came in and came back? No, folks, they were, they were attached to Canaan, okay? Their land was attached right onto Canaan, and so it was very easy for them just to cross the border, grab a city, cross the border, and grab two or three cities, and they did it on a regular basis. But uh, now David is defeating the Philistines. What did David take out of the hand of the Philistines? Can anybody say it? Mechthah Amma. Okay, Megtha Amma. And David took Megtha Amma out of the hand of the Philistines. Did anybody look it up? Megtha Amma. What is it? Uh, the definition of the word is the bridle of the mother city. Okay, that, that's the definition of the word. Uh, Strong defines it as the bit of the metropolis. 
Uh, how many lords ruled over Philistia? Anybody remember? Five. There were five lordships of the Philistines. Okay? There appears to have been one city, one metropolis, that was predominant over the others. Does anybody know who that is? Gath. Gath. Who was from Gath? Goliath was from Gath. Okay, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> when you go over into Chronicles, it says uh, that David had a victory, but he says that he took Gath. Okay, so it appears that Gath was the metropolis. It was the what? Bridal of the mother city. Okay, so uh, the victory at this time was over Gath. Some think that the name uh, involves a stronghold that was located in Gath. Okay, but either way, he would have had to conquer the city to even take the stronghold, would he not? So uh, uh, it was a well-fortified town and uh, one that was very, uh, very prominent for the Philistines. What was the next nation that David smoked? Moab. Moab. Um, let me ask a question. Is David attached to Moab? I heard a yes. Who said that? Yes, okay, because see, if you don't, if you, if you say yes, you have to tell me how. How's David attached to Moab? Anybody remember? Through Ruth. Now, remember when David was fleeing from Saul, he took his mother and father to the king of Moab for protection. Okay, now think about that. The king of Moab, and he protects his mom and dad. Now, what is David doing? Now David has overthrown Moab. What's the question? Yeah, why? Why would he do that? Well, the answer to that question is, me no no. The Bible doesn't tell us why. Uh, could it have been a king change? Sure, it could have been a, a, a you know, change in the monarchy and this monarchy was no longer friendly to David and was now hostile to David. There, there could be any number of reasons as to why David now goes out and conquers Moab. But uh, it was at one time a very uh, uh, you know, friendly ally to David and to his life. Okay? What does it say or what does it mean when it says David measured them with a line? It says this, and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. So what does it mean when he says he measured them with a line? Huh? Yeah. He, he, all, it, all, it, all it means is he, he just divided them into sections. He measured them with a line. Okay? Uh, it may have been that he lined them up and counted them off, right? Could, could have done that. One, two, three. One, two, three. All the ones that... We do that, don't we? So we me he measured them first. Okay? So he just divided them into different sections. Okay? Um, most individuals believe that what he's talking about is that he measured not all of the Moabites, but the fighting men of Moab. Okay? The ones that were warriors against him. Um, what did David do to two of the lines. Yes. Even with two lines measured he to put to death. So how many lines did he measure? Three. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I just hope I'm in what? I just hope I'm in the one that lives. <laughs> Right? Because I don't know which one he killed. But um, I know he killed two lines and he saved one of the lines. Killed two, kept one. Okay? Killed two, kept one. Larry? Some, some commentators say that uh, he killed the older generation that had been enemies before and saved the younger generation. It's hard, it's hard to tell. You know, uh, the text just doesn't tell us very much. It's, it's pretty broad and general, isn't it, about what, what David is doing uh, at this particular time. Just like, did he, did he kill all the Moabites, or did he kill just the, 
the, the armed forces. It's just hard to determine sometimes um, when we talk about these things. But even with two lines measured he to put to death. Um, what did David smite when he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates? Had it easier. David smote also, had it easier, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river of Egypt. I mean the uh, river Euphrates. Let me ask you something. Has anybody ever looked where Euphrates is on a map? Anybody ever looked that up? Okay. Well, I'm not, I don't, <laughs> that wouldn't even make a difference to a lot of people. <laughs> but all I'm saying... This, this border of, Euph- of the Euphrates River, folks, man, it is way up there, okay? When it co- where Israel is today versus where the river Euphrates is, the river Euphrates is way north, okay? In fact, Abraham, when he left Ur of Chaldees, guess what he had to cross? He had to cross the river Euphrates, okay? The Tigris and Euphrates come together and meet, okay? And the land that sprang out from there was called the land of Ur, and so he crossed the river Euphrates, and he was known as the Hebrew. Does anybody know what that means? From across the river, okay? From across the river. That's how major that river was back in those days. It was a huge river, major uh, river. And so uh, they knew that uh, Abraham had crossed the river. He became the he- Hebrew. And his descendants became Hebrews. Those who came from where? Across the river. They were not original descendants of the land of Canaan. And that distinguished them. But when God said that I'm going to give you the land of Canaan, the boundary went from the river of Egypt That's not the Nile, okay? All the way up to what? The river Euphrates. Now notice that David has to go do what? He has to go secure that land back. It had been taken over. Hadadezer had taken it. And so now David goes and he overthrows Hadadezer and he secures that northern boundary. What did David take from Hadadezer? Ah, and David took from him a thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, 20,000 footmen. Is that a pretty good bounty? That's a pretty good bounty, isn't it, for uh, for your battle. A thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, 20,000 footmen. How many chariots did David reserve for himself? Just a hundred. And David hawked all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Okay, so uh, enough horses to uh, uh, run one hundred chariots. Um, it's interesting, some say that the word horses is in italics, and if you look in the King James, guess what? It is. So the text would read like this, And David hawked all the chariots but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Okay? So, the reason, they, the reason that people get all bent out of sh- shape, I guess, is because PETA. Okay? Um, they would say, surely David didn't hawk all those horses. Okay? Folks, that's cutting the tendons of those horses so they're no longer able to fight and, and you know, go into battle. And they just hate that David would do such a thing as that. And so they say, well, look at there. The word horses is in what? Italics. So he really just hawked the what? The chariots, not the horses. And he just reserved a hundred chariots for himself. That's another one of those questions that we have to die, go to God, and ask Him. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you're going to have occasions when uh, the text varies because just little, you know, uh, marks will be, you know, that, those are other questions. Uh, there's times in the biblical text when we do have a few discrepancies, okay? Uh, 700, 7,000, um, but they're, they're nothing that's ever doctrinal, okay? Uh, whatsoever, and occasionally you're going to have um, a few of those kind of things. And again, those are just questions we'll have to ask God about, won't we? Jim? Yeah. 
A lot of times he did, yes. And, uh, you know, he showed uh, uh, Egypt how powerful he was by destroying their chariots. You know, he, he brought them in there and then uh, took, took the wheels off the chariots. And so, yeah, they were, well, they were, uh, you know, the way they dressed those chariots up and, you know, you, that, that was kind of your, uh, almost your, your, your tank in battle, wasn't it? Uh, because if you watch some of the television shows and stuff, they could put blades off those chariots and all kinds of things. And so uh, they could be pretty uh, uh, bad parts of warfare. And so, uh, yeah, uh, they, there was a lot of uh, faith placed in them. Uh, let's see. Who came to succor Hadadezer? And when the Syrians came to succor Hadadezer, king of Zobah, these were the Syrians of Damascus. What's that little word succor mean? Yes, when they came to help him, they came to assist him. How many of the Syrians did David slay? Okay. Two and twenty thousand. Is that a lot? It's quite a few folks, folks. Okay, quite a few folks. Um, more than's died of COVID. <laughs> did you know that? Uh, 22,000. What did David put in Syria? Garrisons. What in the world's a garrison? Yes, it's... Uh, uh, Strong says something stationary. Okay, it's a military post. Uh, you put garrisons there to do what? To secure it, don't you? To make certain that they don't get out of hand, that they follow your will and your dictates. Uh, did Rome do that to a lot of cities? Oh, yes. Uh, Philippi was one of those kind of cities, heavily fortified by um, um, the Roman army in that city. Not only were there, uh, for, was there a fortress there, but also that's where many soldiers retired uh, after uh, they got out of the Roman Empire. Yep. Yep. And he certainly was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> at 22,000, when I said COVID, that's here in Florida, folks. Okay. How many we had in Florida? 14,000, something like that. I believe that's right, 14,500. Quite a few. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you start putting numbers to things, 22,000 dying in a battle, that's a lot of individuals. Uh, true or false, the Syrians refused to bring gifts to David. Thoughts. They brought gifts. Uh, that little word gifts is translated tribute. So in other words, once a uh, commander conquered a city, a nation, a region, what did he do? Tax them. Okay? If you want me to be nice to you, if you don't want me to come back, if you don't want me bothering you, then guess what you do? You pay me a fee. Okay? And so it helped to supplement the empire uh, upon uh, conquering a town. I love this next statement. And the Lord blanked David whithersoever he went. Preserved. Strong says to be open, wide, free, to be safe. To be free or succor. Brown Driver and Briggs says to save, deliver. To deliver from moral uh, troubles, to give victory to. Wow. God was with who? was always with David. I put down this, we must always keep in mind that the nation of Israel was a physical kingdom as well as a spiritual, I mean as, as well as a religion. The other nations were not only hostile people, hostile to the people of God, they were also hostile to God Himself. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of it being a religion, this is a physical nation. So God was with David whither, whithersoever he went, okay? Even in the conquering of enemy nations. So uh, got to keep that in mind as we study the Old Testament. Where did David uh, bring the shields of Hadadezer? Yes, and David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Uh, where would they... Place those kind of shields sometimes. Anybody know? 
Sometimes they would put things in the temple, okay? Uh, at other times, he would place them in the palace, okay? These were uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, little souvenirs of the warfare against another individual. From what two cities of Hadadezer did David take exceedingly much brass? Yes, Bera and what? Berathai. I want you to listen to uh, somebody turn over to 1 Chronicles 18.8. 1 Chronicles 18.8. Now, what did David take from these two cities? A great amount of brass. Who's got 1 Chronicles 18.8? Ah, calls those two cities by a different name, but they're the same two cities. He got tons of what? Tons of brass. Well, folks, that brass didn't go to waste. When Solomon came and built the temple, that great sea, guess what it was built of? Brass, the Bible says, and the pillars and the vessels of brass. So uh, all that stuff that he take, took from Hadadezer, he eventually used in the making of the temple. thought that was pretty interesting. Who heard that David had smitten all the host of Hadadezer? Okay, I was wondering how y'all were going to say that. I wonder if some were going to say it toy, or some were going to say toi. Okay, I don't know how you say it exactly. And Toy King of Hamath heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadadezer. Um... Hamath is supposed to be the famous city of Emesa, suited on the Orontes in Syria, and it's thought that that was his capital. So his uh, capital city was located right on the border of who? Of Syria. Okay? The country of Hadadezer. That's why the Syrians came to help Hadadezer. Uh, the Syrians from Damascus. And so it, it's as if Toy or Toi, had tons of trouble with Hadadezer. Well, now he's been conquered, so what does he do? He just brings David a lot of gifts, you know. Man, you've made my life a whole lot better. Who did Toi send to David to salute him and bless him? Yes, he sent his son, didn't he? He sent Joram, his son, unto King David to salute him and to bless him. Uh, he's called Hadoram in 1 Chronicles 18, verse 10. What did he bring with him when he came to David? All right, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, vessels of brass. Folks, what's David doing? David's getting pretty what? Pretty rich, isn't he? You got all the brass you can need. You got all these chariots now. You've got. Um, uh, all this brass that he took. You've got these shields that you've saved from battle, folks. He's just accumulating all kinds of wealth and riches. Why? Because God has what? God has established him as king of Israel. And what did God say? I will make of thee a great nation. Not just a little piddly nation. I'm going to make of you a great nation. How long had they been a monarchy? Approximately. Just, I'm not asking for definite. Forty years of Saul. The kingdom's now been united under David. How many years passed before that happened? Seven and a half years, right? So, forty-seven and a half years, fifty, fifty-five years, and God is making this nation a powerful, powerful nation. Nation and making David a very wealthy individual. What did David do with Jor Joram's gifts? Yes, dedicated them to the Lord. And also, King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated of all the nations which he subdued. What's that little word dedicate mean? Anybody look it up? He dedicated unto the Lord. It says to make clean ceremonially, morally, to consecrate, sanctify, dedicate, to hallow, to be holy. These are whose? 
These are not mine. These are God's rewards. Okay, so he dedicated them to God. How many nations and kings did David subdue? I've got four, six, seven. Can we count? Five. Four, if you include Hadadezer with Syria. Five, if Hadadezer is separated out of Syria. Okay? If you got of Syria, Moab, Ammon, the Philistines, Amalek, right? And of the spoil, Hadadezer. Son of Rahab, king of Soba. So we got, uh, if, if you put Hadadezer in Syria, which he was part of Syria, you've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, right? Five nations. What did David get for himself after he smote the Syrians in the valley of salt? Ah, he got a name, and David got him a name when he returned home from smiting of the Syrians in the valley of salt. Of salt. Now, what's interesting is this. Most individuals don't believe that should be the Syrians. Who do you think they believe it should be? Anybody study that? Had he already smoked the Syrians? He'd already smitten, had it easier. And the Syrians of Damascus, right? The very next verse says, and he put garrisons where? In Edom. Okay? in Edom. So most individuals think that who he really smoked wasn't the Syrians here, it was who? The Edomites rather than the Syrians. Again, just a, another um, scribal error that in, in transmission uh, because the very next passage says that uh, he uh, had put garrisons in the city or in the land of Edom. Notice verse 20, uh, Question number 25, David put garrisons in Edom, and all of Eden was David's servants. True or false? True. So if, uh, we put, if we read it like this, David got him a name when he returned home from smiting of the Edomites in the Valley of Salt, and he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. So uh, most believe it was uh, Edom that was beaten. How many did he smite there? 18,000, folks. These are huge numbers, aren't they, of individuals. And the Lord blank David, blank he went. Yes, and David and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. He preserved him. Same word that we saw uh, previously. Now here's an interesting statement, okay? As David reigned over Israel, what two things did he execute? Judgment and justice. Okay? Judgment and justice. Uh, did anybody try to do any study on those two words and differentiate between the two? They sound almost identical, don't they? Jim? Okay, anybody else? That's pretty close right there. Okay. Justice and equity. Okay, fairness. Okay. Um, judgment involves a verdict. Okay, like Jim said, the, the choosing between two things. Okay, or making a decision between uh, a, a verdict of innocent or a verdict of condemnation. Okay, so he, was all, he always did what? He reigned over Israel with judgment. In other words, he always made what? Right decisions about who was guilty and who is innocent. Is that important? What, what happens a lot of times in governments to change that? Cronyism, right? You get a lot of family. You get a lot of friends in different positions. Uh, bribery, right? You have a lot of bribery in nations where you pay off people and uh, get judgments flipped and overturned. All kinds of stuff happens in governments, don't they? Well, David didn't allow that in his government, okay? He ruled with judgment 
And uh, he made certain that, you know, if a sentence needed to be carried out, it was carried out. If he needed to decide a case in a certain way, he decided the case in that way. And justice. Um, the word justice, Strong says, means rectitude, righteousness, and Brown, Driver, and Briggs says righteousness. He ruled in righteousness, folks. He ruled how? Rightly. What was the king supposed to make a copy of? And have at his side all the time? Anybody know? Yeah. When a king was made king, according to Deuteronomy the 17th chapter, he was to go and he was to write him a copy of the law. I, that's interesting, isn't it? Would it take him a little while to do that? Yeah. He's got to sit down and he's got to write him a copy of the law. And then he's got to keep it with him throughout the course of his reign. Well, guess what David did? David made the copy, and David ruled in what? Justice. He ruled in righteousness. He ruled according to what? The law of God. All thy commandments are righteousness, David said in Psalm 119, 172. And so, uh, when David had to make choices, he made right choices. Whether it was to condemn or whether it was innocent. And he always made his judgments based upon what? The law of the Almighty God. Folks, do you want a king like that? It's the kind of king I'd like, wouldn't you? Was Saul that kind of a king? No. Saul was not that kind of a king. Now, David wasn't perfect, was he? He wasn't perfect, but uh, he, he was a good king. Questions, comments? Larry? That word justice is used a lot today, but not in this sense. No. Today it's taken on a meaning of what I want. In other words, if this is a decision I want, then that's what justice is. If I, any other decision is not justice. Yeah, yeah it, it, uh, you're exactly right. You know, uh, and, and, or. If it's not done the way I want it, then it's injustice, isn't it? And so, yeah, well, it's, uh, um, but justice, you know, if you define justice as righteousness, then justice is always in accordance with law, okay? And in the case of uh, Israel, it would be in accordance with God's law because that's the law that ruled that nation, okay, totally. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it probably did, you know, but um, that particular instance was kind of a, a mistake, you know. Uh, David, David was pretty well into his reign when he had that affair with Bathsheba. Uh, it, it's going to be after this right here. It's coming up soon, but, um, you know, he was 10, 12, 15 years probably into his reign. Um, and, and he was, I, I think he got caught up into something, sin, personal sin, that, you know, he just... Uh, had to get out of, he thought, you know, and didn't turn that over to God. That's sad. Who was over the hosts? Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Was Joab a pretty wicked man? He was okay. Yeah, later. Hey, who did he kill in cold blood? Abner just killed him, didn't he? You know, and, and David had to stand up against that, didn't he? Uh, folks, Joab is the commander because Joab was the one who overcame the Jebusites in battle. David said, whoever goes up and overcomes the Jebusites, guess what? He becomes my commander. And Joab did that. Okay? And so he's the commander of the forces. Who was David's recorder? Yes, Jehoshaphat was his recorder. Uh, the word recorder means properly to mark. That is, to be remembered. So uh, one who keeps a uh, record of everything that takes place around the king. We might refer to it as the 
person who takes minutes of meetings. What happens when minutes of meetings are taken? What do you do the next minute, the next meeting? You're supposed to read the minutes back, right? Okay, yep, yeah, and, they, and, they're, and they're ratified. But why do you read the minutes from last month's meeting? Yeah, so, so, you, so you remember what was done, what was said, what decisions that were made, and so you read the minutes. Well, somebody has to take the what? Has to take notes, has to take the minutes. Well, that's kind of what Jehoshaphat's job was, to take the minutes of things that happened in and around the president. Who are his two priests? Zadok and who? Ahimelech. True or false? In Israel now, there are two tabernacles. I got one true. I got some people looking at me like, oh no. True or false? In Israel right now, there are two tabernacles. Larry says yes. There are two. One is located in Gibeon. And where is the other located? In Jerusalem. Who built that one? David. And guess what? Each of these two men were over those tabernacles. Isn't that interesting? Pretty interesting. Zadok performed his duties in Gibeon according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 19. And, or 1639, and Ahimelech, he performed his duties in the city of Jerusalem. And both of them were high priests. Pretty interesting, isn't it? I, I, I'm always just... Ba- I, I wish we had more information about how things were being run at certain times uh, in, um, in Jerusalem and, and in the nation of Israel, especially with the tabernacle and with the ark. They were separated so often times. Now we've got two tabernacles, we've got two high priests. Just kind of crazy stuff seems sometimes going on. Who was David's scribe? Yeah, Sariah was his scribe. Um, listen to the definition of the word scribe. To score as a mark, as a tally or record. To count, to recount, to number, to take account of. What was he? We've got, we've got the guy that takes minutes. He's kind of the secretary. Now we have a scribe by the name of Sarai. What's his job? Yeah, he's the Glen of Jerusalem. Okay? He, he's, he's the financial guy in Jerusalem. Okay? It's what he does. Now watch this next one. Who is over the Carathites and Pelathites? Benaniah was over the Carathites and the Pelathites. Now, folks, I ask the next question. Who are these two groups? Oh, isn't that interesting? The Carathites. Strong says that in the sense of executioner. Okay, an executioner. Pelathites. Couriers or messengers. The Targum. Does anybody know what the Targum is? The Targum is the Old Testament, com- the Old Testament commentary of the law. Okay? The Targum says that the Carathites were the archers and the Pelophites were the slingers. Not swingers. Slingers. What were they slinging? Okay, yeah, the sling. So we've got these two groups of individuals, okay? One executioners, but they were good with archery. The other was what? Good with the sling, and they were his couriers, his messengers, and it is believed that both groups were composed of foreign people. Jim just made mention of people of Philistia, warriors from other Nations. That's interesting, isn't it? If that be the case. Uh, I'm not certain whether that is or not, but it's just uh, pretty interesting. Some say that the first group came uh, when he first fled from Saul, and the second group came when he finally made his home in Ziklag. Okay, so you have these Carathites and Pelathites who became his uh, bodyguards. And what did his sons become? 
Chief rulers. Folks, look up that little word rulers and guess how it's translated elsewhere. Priests. But they weren't priests. Okay? They were His ministers. Okay? His chief ministers. Uh, does Trump have some of his family around him as ministers? Yeah, his daughter, son-in-law, they're around him as ministers, chief rulers today. Jim, what were you going to say? What's that? Yeah, I know when he, he one of one of what two I guess I don't know which two places that Carathites and Pelathites. I don't know. I, I have to go do some looking up. He may have. Uh, I have I have to do a little more study on him. Okay, uh, it says that he attacked the Carathites, and uh, so he may have at that time, uh, you know, secured some of them as his bot, as people in his uh, group of men. How many men did he have for a period of time, following him when he's in the wilderness? Started with four hundred, finally went to how many? Six hundred men. So those fighting men came out of that 